what do we really want from philosophy and religion? Palliatives, therapy, comfort. Do we want reassuring fables or an understanding of our actual circumstances? Dismay that the universe does not conform to our preferences seems childish. You might think that grown-ups would be ashamed to put such disappointments into print. The fashionable way of doing this is not to blame the universe, which seems truly pointless, but rather to blame the means by which we know the universe, namely science. If you lived two or three millennia ago, there was no shame in holding that the universe was made for us. It was an appealing thesis consistent with everything we knew. It was what the most learned among us taught without qualification. But we have found out much since then. Defending such a position today amounts to willful disregard of the evidence and a flight from self-knowledge. We long to be here for a purpose even though, despite much self-deception, none is evident. Once we overcome our fear of being tiny, we find ourselves on the threshold of a vast and awesome universe that utterly dwarfs in time, in space, and in potential the tidy, anthropocentric proscenium of our ancestors. We gaze across billions of light years of space to view the universe shortly after the Big Bang and plumb the fine structure of matter. We peer down into the core of our planet and the blazing interior of our star. We read the genetic language in which is written the diverse skills and propensities of every being on Earth. We uncover hidden chapters in the record of our own origins and with some anguish better understand our nature and prospects. We invent and refine agriculture without which almost all of us would starve to death. We create medicines and vaccines that save the lives of billions. We communicate at the speed of light and whip around the earth in an hour and a half. We have sent dozens of ships to more than 70 worlds and four spacecraft to the stars. How much more satisfying had we been placed in a garden custom made for us, its other occupants put there for us to use as we saw fit. There is a celebrated story in the Western tradition like this, except that not quite everything was there for us. There was one particular tree of which we were not to partake, a tree of knowledge. Knowledge and understanding and wisdom were forbidden to us in this story. We were to be kept ignorant, but we couldn't help ourselves. We were starving for knowledge, created hungry, you might say. This was the origin of all our troubles. In particular, it is why we no longer live in a garden. We found out too much. So long as we were incurious and obedient, I imagine, we could console ourselves with our importance and centrality and tell ourselves that we were the reason the universe was made.
As we began to indulge our curiosity though, to explore, to learn how the universe really is, we expelled ourselves from Eden. Angels with a flaming sword were set as sentries at the gates of paradise to bar our return. The gardeners became exiles and wanderers. Occasionally we mourn that lost world, but that, it seems to me, is maudlin and sentimental. We could not happily have remained ignorant forever. There is in this universe much of what seems to be design. The significance of our lives and our fragile planet is then determined only by our own wisdom and courage. We are the custodians of life's meaning. We long for a parent to care for us, to forgive us our errors, to save us from our childish mistakes. But knowledge is preferable to ignorance, better by far to embrace the hard truth than a reassuring fable. If we crave some cosmic purpose, then let us find ourselves a worthy goal.